announcements this morning. We've got an egg hunt coming up on Wednesday at 6 o'clock here at the church. Um, we've got Good Friday service at 6.30 on Friday at Valonia Christian Church. We will be um, providing the special for that. And anyone who would like to um, sing with us, um, we will be making a joyful noise. <laughs> so right after church, we're going to meet up here. It's going to be a song that you are all familiar with, the old rugged cross. Um, you just have to make a sound. That's all we ask. <laughs> Sunrise service is March 31st at 7 a.m. Don't forget to sign up in the back if you intend to um, attend the breakfast because we want to make sure there's enough food for everyone. And there are annual reports in the foyer, so make sure you get one of those. Um, the solar eclipse is on April 8th, and from 11 to 5, um, they're going to have a viewing party here. Um, food's going to be available, music, games, uh, fellowship, bring your lawn chairs, yard games and glasses, your Eclipse classes, and enjoy. Um, May 4th, there's a Mother Day, Mother's Day brunch from 10 to 12. Um, there's a sign-up list, I believe, in the back on the bulletin board. And our special offering on Easter is going to be split between Clarity Pregnancy Services and Hilltop Christian Camp. Um, so if, if you're praying about that, continue to pray about that. And I know they both spoke with us. Um, so be thinking about that. The annual church camp out is at Starve Hollow and will be on September 20th through 22nd. And we know sites are hard to get, so get on that if you intend to um, be there with us for that. Um, that's all the announcements I have. Does anyone else have? I did hear that. <clears throat> So if you need a site, you might get on that pretty soon. Um, please stand with me and we'll have our call to worship. This morning is Palm Sunday, and so we've got a little bit different of a call to worship. Um, we're going to be doing a responsive reading. So um, the words will be printed on the screen, and I'll read the worship leaders, and you all will read when you're prompted to do so. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus steadfastly set out for Jerusalem. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Join me as we go to our Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time here this morning that, that we can focus on you and you alone, God, that we can lift up our, our worship time to you that you make it all glory and honor and praise, God. May everything that we do and say here be pleasing to you. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Our first hymn of praise will be hymn number 137, Tell Me the Story. We'll be singing verses 1, 2, and 3. Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweet as that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings to earth. The story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. 
Tell me the story most precious, sweet as that ever was heard. Casting alone in the desert, tell of the days that are past. How for our sins he was tempted, yet was triumphant at last. Tell of the years of his labor, tell of the sorrow he bore. He was despised and afflicted, homeless, rejected, and poor. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweet as that ever was heard. Love the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him, tell how he liveth again. Love in that story so tender, clearer than ever I see. Stay, let me weep while you whisper, love paid the ransom for me. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Turn and greet those around you before being seated. Our next hymn of praise will be hymn number 138, One Day, and we'll be singing verses 1 through 5. Justified freely forever. 
Since Jesus is mine, living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glory I'll stay. All right, our final hymn of praise is not found in our hymn book, but I think most of you will know it. It's, it's We Will Glorify. Glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. We will worship Him in righteousness. We will worship Him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to Him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. Right, our special this morning will be by Nathan Haynes.
Kids are dismissed to children's church. Seems like they mostly know the drill. I'm glad I could be here and help out in this way. Uh, I do not have a Palm Sunday message, so I want to thank Megan for putting together what she did, and I think this morning's service has gone great so far, hoping it continues in that direction. Uh, this message is one that was put together, and I really, it's one that I look at and I just hope and pray that somehow God is glorified and you are edified, and if that happens, well then, it's good enough. The other day I was asked what I knew. It's kind of one of those questions that we ask each other in passing on a regular basis. And usually we come up with something quick or something funny and just go on with our day, not really meaning anything by it. And I thought about it. I was like, you know, I know a lot of things. I've forgotten more. Maybe I know a few things. I know that I love my wife. I know that she loves me. I know I love my kids. I know that sin in my life has caused incredible pain for me and those close to me. I could go on listing my troubles. I could stay here all morning and, and just tell you story after story of, of hardship. I could get stuck in my head and say, woe is me. But there's one thing that I do know, two things really. I know that life is hard, and I know that God is good. Life is hard, but God is good. And you will have to uh, bear with me if I get a bit emotional this morning. <laughs> I know. Sometimes when we're in the thick of it, when bad things happen, we start to think we have it harder than anyone else. We get stuck in our heads and, and think about all of our hardships, all of our troubles, all of our pain, whatever the source of that pain may be, and we start to think, no one has it as bad as me. But if you take a moment, if you stop, really, and take a look around, and you'll notice something real quick, and that is that people are hurting. Everywhere, people are hurting. And it's not to compare hardships, it's not to say that one person has it harder than me, so maybe I should just suck it up and move on, put on my big boy britches. That's not what it's about, it's, it's the acknowledgement that everyone's hurting. In one way or another, people are hurting. In my English class, my students read the book The Outsiders. It's a good book. I very much enjoyed it when I was a student. I enjoyed reading it again as an adult. It's about the, the Soches and the Greasers. It's, it's two different gangs. You have the, the preppy kids, the Soches, and you've got the Greasers. They're, they're more gang-like and you know the leather jackets and greased up hair. Uh, this, was, this was a while back. Not too far back. <laughs> and one of the main lessons that the students learn in the Greasers is taught by Sherry, Sherry Valance. And that lesson is, it's rough all over. Pony Boy, the main character, he, he thinks that he's got it tough. And he does. He, he lost his parents when he was young. His friend has abusive parents. He does have it tough. It's very rough for him and his friends, for sure. But one of the Soches, this girl Cherry, she lets him know it's rough all over. Everyone has their problems. It doesn't mer matter where you are on the economic ladder, where you are socially, everyone has their problems. It's rough all over. And the whole point of the book the whole point that the author was, was trying to make, that S.E. Hinton was trying to make, at the very end, it, it comes all together. And the whole point is, it's rough all over for everyone, so be nice to people. Be nice to people. I feel like you probably have a, a Bible verse or two about that. 
the second greatest commandment being one of them, to love our neighbor as ourself. And we're told repeatedly over and over to show love, mercy, and compassion. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Maybe you're not going through a rough time right now. Go and be Jesus to someone. Because you're either going through a rough time or you're not. And if you're not, somebody needs you. Show some compassion. They need that. Compassion, if you get down to the root words of it, and it's Latin, I'm not going to bother getting into the, the Latin words, but it essentially means to suffer together. That's what compassion is. Suffering with one another. And Jesus, over and over and over in Scripture, it tells us that he would see the people and he would have compassion. He would see his people suffering. He would see our suffering. And he would have compassion. He would suffer with us. Jesus showed compassion all the time. And Jesus continues to suffer with us today. And that encourages me knowing that God knows my pain. God's not a far off God. He's not distant. He's not unfeeling. God knows my pain. He suffers with me and will wipe away every tear. God knows my physical pain. He knows of our illnesses, of our injuries, of the things that never quite heal. God knows that. God knows my emotional pain. He knows the relationships that I have. He understands the heartache. He understands betrayal. He understands loss. And God knows my spiritual pain. God knows our guilt. And he knows of our suffering from sin and from shame. God knows a lot. And our God is a God of compassion. He knows how much our sin hurts us because he's hurting right there with us. And I think that's part of why he wants us to stop so badly, not for his own sake, but because he knows exactly what we're going through. God knows how much we're hurting. God knows how much our sin hurts us. That's why he protects us from it or tries to protect us from it. We get in the way of that. Your sin, my sin, our sin, all of it causes God to suffer because he suffers with us. He knows how much pain our sin is causing us. He knows how much pain my sin has caused me. And oftentimes when we talk about our sin and we talk about our, our suffering and God's suffering on our behalf, we usually put it past tense. We usually think about, well, well, God nailed my sin to the cross. It's a done deal. God suffered once. Jesus suffered once. He bled and he died for my sin, and it's all over. In Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 5, one of my favorite verses in the Old Testament, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We think of a verse like that, and we think of Jesus suffering for our sin and dying on the cross, and it was done, that his suffering was over. What I'm about to say might come as a shock to some of you. Being in Christ, being a Christian, is a relationship. And that might come as a shock, because I've preached a whole sermon about that very issue and how much it drives me nuts when people say Christianity isn't a religion, it's a relationship. Well, it's both. It is a religion, but it is a relationship too. And our relationship with God, well, it hurts when we sin. Our relationship with God, it's... Our sin actively hurts that relationship. That is ongoing. You are in a relationship with God. We are the bride of Christ. 
If that's not a relationship, I don't know what is. In our sin, I promise you, it hurts our Father in heaven. It hurts the, act, the relationships around us. And you might not see it, but it does. You might not see it, but it does. But thanks be to God, He has reconciled us to Himself through Christ. God took care of repairing the relationship. Despite our unfaithfulness, God is faithful. Praise be to God. But just because a relationship is restored doesn't mean the pain stops. There's still a lot of healing that has to happen. You might think that our sin, whatever it might be, it's not hurting anyone else. It's a secret. As long as it's your secret, it's not hurting anyone but you. I promise that's not true. You're hurting those around you with that sin that you're keeping secret. And most of all, you're hurting your Father in heaven. And I don't say this preaching down at you. <laughs> the whole reason this isn't a, a pocket sermon that I pulled out that was made a long time ago is because this is what I'm going through myself. Coming to grips with past sin, past struggles, current sin, current struggles, temptation, reconciliation. Another book that I had my students go through, and it's amazing how God will use different things to speak to us, but another book my students have been going through is Frankenstein. You might be thinking, what in the world is God going to tell you through Frankenstein? Well, a, a whole lot. It actually got pretty preachy at times. Victor Frankenstein creates a monster, a being. Throughout the whole book, he never gives it a name. It's always a fiend or a monster or a devil or a demon. It's never given a name. But as soon as he finishes his creation, he's mortified by what he's done. It's a lot like sin in that way. He got caught up in his experiments. He got caught up in the science looking for achievements. And as soon as he was finished, he saw the work of his hands and there was nothing good to come of it. His excitement gave way to sin and to guilt and he carried that guilt with him through the rest of the book. And he had to keep it a secret. Despite what the movies show, um, the original classic Frankenstein movie, he's got people helping him to create the monster, and he tells people about it right away, and it's no big secret at all. That's not the case in the book. In the book, it stays a secret. And Victor carries this secret with him through the whole book, and I'm sorry, spoiling, but this book has been out for a long time. <laughs> you had your chance. But he's created this monster, and it's his secret, and he carries it with him. And through the whole book, one of the major themes is the guilt and the pain and the despair that he experiences as he carries that secret of what he's done. And if that doesn't connect with sin in your life, if you're keeping secret, I don't know what does. Every time someone discovers something, when they say they think they know why he's sad, he immediately goes in his mind to that sin that he's keeping secret. You ever do that? The sight and sound of others having joy haunts him. Because if only they knew his secret, they wouldn't be so happy. They wouldn't be so proud. They wouldn't have that joy. At one point, he's speaking with his professors, and they're praising him for his, his scientific advancements. They know that he's done a lot of things. He's far exceeded anyone else at his university, and they're praising him for it, but they don't know his secret. They don't know what he's done. And so even the very topic of science is irksome to him. It, it is loathsome, and it causes him to despair and to hurt. And so he doesn't even want to talk about it. And they think that he doesn't want to talk about it because he's being humble, because he's expressing humility. But the reality is his guilt and his shame is breaking him. Don't we do that? Mary Shelley had a 
She had a very interesting life. I'm not going to get into to her past. But she knew some things, I think, when she wrote that book. Throughout the whole book, we see Victor Frankenstein suffering as a result of his sin. It's, it's, it's like I told my students. I, I, can't, I can't preach to my students in school. You're not allowed to do that. I can't preach to them with the Bible. I can preach to them with Frankenstein. And I tell them it's, it's like when they get a good grade on a test. And Grandma's so proud of them. Praising them, telling them how well they've done. And the whole time they know they cheated. They didn't earn that grade. They stuck in, they snuck in some notes or looked at someone else's paper. And so that whole time, Grandma's praising them, giving them accolade after accolade and just loving on them for how good they've done. She's so proud. And all the while, they know that they didn't earn it, that it's all a lie. And now they've got to keep this secret. Because if they let that secret go, well, Grandma's going to be disappointed. It's going to cause hurt. So we keep our secrets thinking that we're not hurting anyone but ourselves. That's not true. It related to me, I, I believe it relates to you. During the construction of his monster in chapter 4, this is what Victor had to say. He says, Every night I was oppressed by a slow fever, and I became nervous to a most painful degree. The fall of a leaf startled me, and I shunned my fellow creatures as if I had been guilty of a crime. In the story, Victor is drove nearly to suicide. He considers it. I know that, that many people do when you feel oppressed by guilt, sin, shame, or maybe just the hurts of everything else. Maybe you're on the receiving end and the hurt is so great from whatever sin has happened that you feel like you're right there. Victor was always wondering when he would be found out. He was always scared, never able to open up to anyone, always living on guard, living in fear. We don't have to live that way. I want to encourage you to confess your sins. It'll go much better for you if you do. It doesn't have to be to everyone. Find the person that you need to do that to. But confess your sins and don't keep that a secret that you're hiding from everyone. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 it says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive, our, deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We might not be faithful to our God, but he is. He is faithful, and we are all sinners, each and every one of us. Confessing sin is hard, I'm not suggesting that it's easy. It hurts. Fighting temptation is hard. You'll fight temptation all your life. Life is hard. But God is good. We aren't in this alone. God has already done the work of reconciling us to Him. God can use our suffering for His glory. God uses our suffering for his glory. And he can and often does use it for our benefit. I think there's a couple of scriptures about that as well. Finishing up, I, I want this one exhortation for you, for us, the church. We, the church, the bride of Christ, exist as a place to encourage one another and to spur one another towards love and good deeds. That is part of our mission. That is part of our job as the church, as Christians, as followers of Christ. And I want to close with some words from Paul to the church in Thessalonica. It encourages me when I look at Scripture and, and see the things that Paul has written. And a lot of times when we look at Scripture, we look at it as a book for, okay, this is what it means to be a Christian. These are the teachings for me. But sometimes it's good to remember that these letters... These Gospels, they were written to a people that needed them. 
The church in Thessalonica was not perfect. Paul had to write these letters to them and instruct them. Sometimes it was really, really hard. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 18. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you and who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. Life is hard, but God is good. Let's pray. Lord God and Heavenly Father, thank you for reconciling us to you, for being faithful to us despite our failures, our sin. Thank you for loving us. And Lord God, we are sorry. We apologize. We repent for the harm that we've caused to each other and to you. Lord God, send your spirit to this church that we might lift one another up, encourage one another, and strengthen one another. Lord God, life is hard and you know it because you've been here. But Lord, we know you are good. And we thank you for that. Bless here at this time as we remain in your house and give you all the praise and the glory for it all belongs to you. In the name of our Lord Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. We're coming to our invitation song and I would uh, encourage you if you do have something that you need to confess I pray that you would consider that this morning. Um, let's go into our, our time of invitation. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, washed it white as snow. For now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the upper spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus has paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. to claim I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's lamb Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow and when before the throne I stand in him complete. Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson. 
crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. The word choice has come up quite a bit this past month in my various studies. This past Wednesday in our men's study, the author was making the point about how much God loves us. God doesn't force us to love him and accept him. He gives us enough knowledge and evidence of his power and love and then gives us the choice if we will follow him or not. What a loving God. The week before, we talked about the impact abortion has had on the world and standing up for the unborn who don't get a choice when that decision is made, conveniently removing God from the equation in the formation of a child by framing that child as a choice instead of a little tiny human that God created. In Sunday school, David chose a lesson to lead us up to Easter, Max Licato's, he chose the nails. Our sessions, he chose to be one of us. He chose to forgive us. He chose to invite us into his presence. He chose to love us forever. He chose to give us victory. In my daily chronological Bible reading this week, I'm in Deuteronomy. Moses is pleading for the people to listen to God as they're on their up and down journey. And this is what he says in chapter 30, verses 19 and 20. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may be the love, that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him, for the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham Isaac and Jacob. This brings me to our Lord's Supper. I'll read from Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. I love Jesus' words in verse 15. I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. That word eagerly, another translation uses earnestly, and another uses fervently. We see Jesus' passion and love in this moment. The central reason why he came to man to institute a new covenant with us based on his own sacrifice. He chose to go to the cross for my sins, your sins, and the sin of mankind. As we partake of the emblems this morning, let us ponder on the choice that Jesus made for us and how we can honor him in this time of remembrance. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a time of our service where we stop and we remember. And Lord, today we remember each one of us that we all have sin. We all fall short over and over. But we take this time to remember what you did for us through Jesus. That Jesus would die for us so that we can have forgiveness and we can have the grace that you extend to us. 
and our hope of eternal life. I ask that you'd bless this little wafer that represents your body that was broken for us and this cup of juice that represents your spilt blood. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.